This is Ann Mason with the DC NRHS Program Committee, and we are very, very happy to have you here tonight. Tonight we have an, a really great program on the history of refrigerated rail cars. Before we get started, we just want to remind you about a little bit about the DC NRHS chapter. Our chapter's mission is to expand the public appreciation of railroads and their history through preservation and education. And we do this by sponsoring a scholarship to rail camp for a high school student, by preserving and operating our beloved 1923 Pullman car, the Dover Harbor, celebrating its 100th anniversary this year, we maintain a railroad library at Bowie Tower, Maryland, and we publish our monthly newsletter, The Timetable. Another way we do this is by offering these free monthly programs, including tonight's event. And tonight, we're delighted to welcome back railroad historian James McDonald. Now, James has traveled many paths over the years and spent his formative years in visiting the rail shops of Maryland and Pennsylvania. He was an exchange student and became interested in railroads around the world. And he's no stranger to railroad history and railroad museums, having served as a Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum member and train crew for many years and associated with their equipment restoration. He also worked in a graphic designer in the railroad, model railroad field. And all of this led him to advanced degrees in history and working as a research historian. And we are the beneficial hearing recipients of this knowledge. James is active in several railroad historical societies where he serves as vice president of the Richmond, Fredericksburg and Potomac Railroad Historical Society. And last month we heard a whole history of Potomac Yard. So we hope you'll check out on our DC NRHS YouTube channel. Tonight, we're really delighted to have him back for another engagement to talk about another one of his specialty railroad research topics, this time, the history of refrigerated rail cars and how they came to change both the food we eat and the railroad industry that we enjoy. So with that, over to you, James. Hi, everyone, and thanks, Anne. Um, thanks also to Garen and Jim for inviting me to speak to you this evening and for all of you for attending. Um, today, we're going to take a look, as Anne said, at the history of the North American refrigerator car and perishable goods transportation by rail. As we get started here, I wanted to just review some of the major themes uh, that you're going to hear about this evening. Uh, one of the big ones is that Food and refrigerator cars are linked in a mutually shaping relationship. Refrigerator cars changed how Americans ate. They diminished the seasonality of foods and made once exotic foods commonplace. And they ensured a steady supply of food when this wasn't always guaranteed previously. But as we'll see, refrigerator cars changed themselves in response to eating practices. What people ate actually changed how the food moved on the rails and what was used to carry it. Another thing to take away is that many of the main actors that were driving perishable food transportation were private companies, not the railroads themselves. Many refrigerator cars were not owned by the railroads, but by the companies uh, that wanted to move the food and paid railroads to move those cars for them. Lastly, state and federal governments interceded at multiple points to modify refrigerator car design. So the three major takeaways from today's talk. There's a rather long history of refrigerated transportation on the rails. Um, there were experiments that began in the 1840s and 50s to move uh, perishable goods by the rail. 
Uh, the earliest experiments reportedly took place in 1842 in New England and lasted at least a couple of years before they um, disappeared quietly. As far as we can tell, they may have consisted of simply just putting perishable goods into a boxcar and packing ice around it. But in the 1850s, there were additional experiments. Uh, but it's not really until after the Civil War that refrigerator cars came into anything approximating widespread use. Now, refrigerator cars leading up to the Civil War and around the time of the Civil War were based on boxcars. Uh, but they had double walls with various different things placed in between the walls uh, to use as insulation. Most common at the time before the Civil War was sawdust or charcoal. And the cars were typically cooled with ice that was secured from ponds in wintertime. And in the summertime, they would harvest the ice from the ponds in the wintertime and store it in ice houses so that they could have it in the summertime as well. The first car that could be considered a commercial and engineering success was that of William Davis in 1868. He intended this car to ship fish, but it came to be used for other perishables as well. Davis's design involved hanging the cargo from the roof and having boxes of ice mounted on the car's floor. The meat packer George Hammond uh, started using a car based on uh, Davis's design to ship uh, meat from Detroit to Eastern locations in 1869. In the 1870s, uh, refrigerator car designs become uh, much more commercially successful and less experimental. One of the uh, designs that proved especially fruitful was uh, one developed by a lawyer turned inventor, Joel Tiffany. In 1877, he developed a refrigerator car that stored the ice in bunkers underneath the roof, suspended above the load, and that design would be embraced by a number of different shippers. Tiffany made modifications over time to improve his design, and his cars were used into the 20th century. Another design that found widespread adoption was one by John Wicks. Wicks's refrigerator car likewise appeared in 1877, but his idea was to have ice stored in bunkers at the ends of the car. Wicks's design continued to be modified and also served into the early 20th century. So this image was shown earlier, but I wanted to just give you a look inside of what a refrigerator car of the uh, late 19th century would have looked like. The ice would have been stored in bunkers on either end of the car. They're labeled there as ice tanks. Um, and in this particular case, this is a car for carrying meat and packing house products. So you have sides of beef hanging from hooks on the roof and various boxes and barrels filled with sausages and other cut and dressed meat products. And the cars were uh, typically about 36 feet in length. While not the first to ship perishables by rail, meatpacker Gustava Swift is due much credit for this practice becoming commonplace. A native New Englander, Swift transplanted himself to the Midwest and in the 1880s sought practical ways to sell Chicago dressed meats to East Coast markets. Swift faced an uphill battle. Not only did the idea of purchasing meat that had been slaughtered several days before sit poorly with most contemporary consumers, the railroads declined to help Swift by providing him cars to ship his meats. Refrigerator cars were expensive to build and maintain. They cost about twice as much as ordinary boxcars. And because they couldn't be used to ship a load back or for any other cargo besides what they were shipping, uh, intended to ship, they spent half of their time in transit empty. So they, they literally cost twice as much to make and twice as much to operate as an ordinary boxcar. Furthermore, most of the railroads that were servicing Chicago and going from Chicago to the East Coast, the lines that Swift wanted to use, they had a financial stake in the transportation of live animals. They had built an entire infrastructure with feedlots and places for animals to rest. Uh, so they had a lot of capital investment in live animals rather than dead ones, including many of them were investors in the Chicago Union stockyards. So the shipment of dead animals really didn't appeal to railroad standing business interests. Meatpacker Armour uh, was uh, 
successful in using Swift's idea when Swift was able to finally convince the railroads to ship his meat. He uh, finally managed to get the Grand Trunk Railway to ship meat for him uh, and was quite successful in selling meat, uh, chilled beef uh, on the East Coast. And so the major meat packers followed suit. Armour jumped in with both feet and began to cultivate the transport, not only of the meats that they manufactured, but California produce. They shipped California produce to Eastern markets. One of the keys to Armour's success was signing exclusive contracts with railroads. When customers contacted a railroad and asked to have something perishable shipped, the railroad would just connect them to Armour. And since Armour and the other meat packers had had to build an entire infrastructure of icing in order to ship their, their products and keep them cold underway, this was very attractive to railroads to rely on the meat packers to ship perishables so that the railroads didn't have to themselves invest in icing infrastructure. It worked out fairly well for everyone at first. Now, I want to take a moment to talk about some terminology because you'll see very often that I talk here about refrigerator car lines. The meat packers begin to brand the refrigerator car services that they offer as lines, but they weren't lines as in a specific route traveling from A to B. They're more like lines um, in the sense of in the service of similar to how steamship companies might have referred to themselves also as lines like the Cunard line or the Black Star line. They weren't actually named after where they went, but whom they served. And each one of the major meat packers had its own uh, re refrigerator car line, the Armour car line, Swift refrigerator lines, et cetera. And um, some of the companies operated subsidiaries under different names as well, such as Armour's California Fruit Express. So the lines were divisions within the meatpacking companies, like the transportation division inside the meatpacking company was referred to as a line. And this terminology carries on afterwards. So how do we actually keep all of these, this beef from going bad underway or the meat? The success of the meat packers at using refrigerator cars required them to use frozen water, ice, uh, ice, was the primary refrigerant from the earliest days of refrigerated rail transport. And it persisted for some fashion uh, into the 1970s. And the main source of ice was this, pond water frozen and sawed out during the winter time uh, and then loaded itself into refrigerator cars, packed in sawdust and uh, shipped to locations around the country. Now, natural ice, as you can imagine, is also a perishable commodity. The majority of this infrastructure for storing ice and loading it into refrigerator cars in order to cool them was built by the meat packers, by private companies, not by railroads. Now, some railroads did begin to follow the meat packers lead into perishable transport and constructing an icing infrastructure, but the meat packers dominated this trade. The development of mechanical ice making had begun in the uh, latter half of the 19th century. Um, and it was driven in the main by demand for ice in Southern states where it was difficult to find pond ice and obtain it cheaply. The dominance of manufactured ice in Northern areas came much more slowly, but it did get a big push in the 1880s when public concern over hygiene caused many people to switch away from using pond ice on the rails, however, the use of pond ice persisted in some areas well into the 20th century. So I thought it would be a good idea for, for you to see a little bit of the icing um, as it happens. So keeping a refrigerator cool with ice was labor and capital intensive. Here we see workers loading ice from a truck onto the top of refrigerator cars. Now these are cars at a meat packers facility. There's a gentleman with a sledgehammer who's breaking up the ice into smaller chunks. Uh, now they're adding salt to the ice. This uh, changed the melting point of the ice and, and made it colder inside the refrigerator car. They cover over the bunker hatch with an insulated plug, and then another hatch is closed to secure everything. Now here, the gentleman is going inside. Look how thick the door is of the car. That's all insulation. 
inside the car, they had racks that were placed on the floor so that air could circulate underneath the uh, load and uh, cool on all sides. You see he's in checking the end of the ice bunker there to make sure that the cool air is coming through. Uh, and then after this, the loads are placed into the car. In this case, it's uh, chickens from the armor factory. They're going through and tabulating everything, making sure that uh, the weights are measured out properly. This was important not just for the car, but also so they knew what temperature to try and keep it at. In order to keep everything at a good stable temperature, they would only fill the car about two thirds full so that the cars weren't packed in so tightly that the cool temperature would be able to circulate around it. And then generally speaking, refrigerated trains would be given priority as they moved across the railroad. Um, here we see a train moving through with a number of refrigerated cars. About every hundred miles or so in the journey, they would stop to add more ice. Um, next thing you're gonna see here is an icing station where they're now pushing blocks of ice onto the roofs of the car and then breaking them up using these long picks uh, so that the ice will melt in the fashion that get, gets it to the temperature that the shipper wants. Um, so different size blocks of ice will give different cooling results along the route. So I thought it might be interesting for you to just see how that's done. Now the meat packers had built most of their ice uh, facilities, um, but there were concerns about the meat packers owning the icing facilities. If you remember from the presentation that I gave last month about Potomac Yard, the armor company owned most of the icing facilities, including the mutual ice company at Potomac Yard. And this began to get them into a little bit of friction with the federal government. There were concerns that the uh, meatpacking companies were price fixing and giving discounts to certain customers, but not to others. And it reached the level of congressional hearings. Uh, so that when the 1906 Hepburn Act was passed, which many of you probably know as the law that gave the Interstate Commerce Commission uh, enforcement powers over the railroad in new ways, uh, ICC was able to regulate ice prices as well. And it also uh, ruled that the railroads um, had to provide refrigerator cars if customers requested them. Uh, before, if the customer had requested an, uh, a refrigerator car, the railroads could refuse. They could say that they didn't have the equipment, but now the railroads were required to provide that. And uh, the Hepburn Act's uh, stipulations, uh, regulation of the railroad, would govern much of railroad regulatory structures until 1980. The linkage of the transportation, service, and storage infrastructure between the place that the food was initially chilled and where it was consumed is called the cold chain. Now, railroads were initially very reticent to create their own cold chains. Um, the cold chain was created because the beef packers needed it. And it took a large investment in ice houses and refrigerator cars combined with the business acumen and the networks necessary to monetize the food after it had been shipped None of that fit necessarily well into the railroad's existing business model. As they began to move into the business of perishable transport, railroads leaned heavily on the private car model, either through direct arrangements, uh, contractual arrangements even with private car companies to manage the re refrigerated services for railroads, or by establishing their own refrigerator car companies, which were often using the model that had been forged by the private car companies. Railroads eventually gained dominance in the perishable markets over the meat packers after the First World War, but the contours of the cold chain that the beef companies had set in place in um, the 19th century substantially shaped the way that uh, railroads would approach the entire cold chain. And the cold chain had some challenges too, because the refrigerators that people had, uh, you know, not everybody had a refrigerator in their home. Um, and so uh, the cold chain had to expand not only in terms of a refrigerator car, but in terms of retail stores and homes in order for perishable foods uh, to be really adopted and eaten in great numbers. 
As the railroads became more involved in the perishable transport, three types of refrigerator car lines arose. Now, we already talked about private car lines. They were owned by private companies, and they paid the railroads to transport their cars, but they were using their own cars. The meat packers were one example. The lines, as I said, they were the transportation divisions with inside the meat packing company's wider corporate umbrella. Some single railroads uh, invested in their own fleet of refrigerator cars and began to offer specialized perishable shipments to their customers. Uh, they often established wholly owned subsidiary companies to manage refrigerator cars since the handling of reefers, reefers being slang for refrigerators, if anyone is not familiar with that term, um, it was very different than an ordinary freight car. It took a lot more uh, to, uh, to manage. So sometimes they would establish subsidiaries for that. Other railroads sometimes joined together to pool their resources and establish what were called cooperative car lines. These generally involved establishing a separate business entity that handled all of the complexities unique to refrigerator cars that sat outside of the ordinary freight handling, things like icing and the specialized way bills. Participant railroads would often hold stock in the cooperative car line. Refrigerator car lines, the railroad-based refrigerator car lines, um, one of the benefits with working through a refrigerator car line was that a railroad could request refrigerator cars from the car line only when it needed them, such as at peak harvest seasons. So the cars weren't sitting around idle when there wasn't anything to ship. In the cooperative model, the operating costs were often spread across multiple railroads so that the more expensive refrigerator car technology and the labor required to manage and maintain that fleet of cars was distributed. Additionally, several of the refrigerator car lines were also builders of refrigerator cars, which could construct, which did construct refrigerator cars for their own use and sale to other operating companies. So this is a quick list of the major refrigerator car lines that were established uh, in the early, well, some of them are older, but at the beginning of the 20th century. So in the 1920s, you have all of these companies. These are the biggest players. There were others, but let's take a quick look at who they were and what they did. The oldest was Merchants Dispatch Transportation. It was founded by the New York Central in 1848. And it was initially a subsidiary company that was used to carry specialized freight. But by 1880, it was transformed to a company that only handled refrigerated traffic, perishable traffic. Now, uh, Merchants Despatch, or MDT, owned its own shops, which manufactured refrigerator cars for its own use and for sale and lease to other companies. It eventually also made non-refrigerated freight cars and cabooses for the New York Central and its affiliated railroads. Uh, several railroads leased from MDT, such as the Illinois Central, the Gulf Mobile in Ohio. Not sure about the Boston and Maine. I, that might have been a copy and paste error, but certainly the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western was involved as well. I think that was supposed to be the Boston and Albany, not the Boston and Maine. So there was also a cooperative line based in the Midwest out of St. Louis called the American Refrigerator Transit. It was a cooperative line formed by the Missouri Pacific and the Wabash Railroads. It was uh, also a rather early line. Um, eventually, through mergers, the exact railroads involved in ART would change. Uh, the Norfolk and Western, for example, got involved after taking over the Wabash. Uh, the Union Pacific eventually uh, came to own American Refrigerator Transit uh, when it took over the Missouri Pacific. The Santa Fe Railroad decided to form its own refrigerator line entirely called the Santa Fe Refrigerator Dispatch. It was a major player in the Southwest. Also in the Southwest, and if, what eventually became the largest by number of cars uh, of all of the uh, refrigerator car lines was Pacific Fruit Express. Uh, it was formed jointly by the Union Pacific and the Southern Pacific. And its primary function uh, was to distribute the products of the West agricultural lands, especially California produce uh, to Eastern points. Eventually, the Western Pacific also participated in this. Those of you who attended my talk last month about Potomac Yard know that in 1920, Armour was forced to go through antitrust legislation and divest itself of its rail car holdings and icing infrastructures. 
Fruit Growers Express was founded by several railroads out of what Armour had to give up. Fruit Growers Express served as a refrigerator car line for more than a dozen stockholder railroads. There's a list of them on your screen. It's quite considerable. It dominated the Southeast and established a corporate alliance with two Midwestern and Western refrigerator car companies, um, the Western Fruit Express of the Great Northern and the Burlington Refrigerator Express of the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy. This gave Fruit Growers Express a coast-to-coast -coast presence. There were other options as well. There were uh, different versions of this. Some railroads simply elected to take on the efforts and costs of operating their own refrigerator services. Uh, the Northern Pacific and the Bangor and Aroostook were two railroads that did that. Many railroads leased refrigerator cars as they needed from major car builders or from other car lines. The Milwaukee Road, the Sioux Line, and the Chicago and Northwestern were prominent uh, users of that type of service, of leasing cars. And similar approaches were taken by smaller private companies who couldn't afford to buy their own cars. Um, the leasing of cars, I mean. Many dairies and breweries, especially in the Midwest, would get one or two or five or 10 cars, not enough to buy, so they would just lease them. And after being told they couldn't operate their own lines by the federal government, most of the meat packers sold their meat cars to the leasing companies and leased those same cars back again. So in the 1980s, uh, the 1890s, excuse me, refrigerator cars started to develop design characteristics based on what they carried or how they carried it. This divergence was based on the needs of two different kinds of shippers, meat packers and produce packers, and how fast things needed to move. Meat refrigerators were designed to work inside meat processing facilities. They changed very little in their construction and use from their uh, beginning years until the 1950s. And what change did occur with meat packing cars reflected the needs and preferences of the meat packers. Fruits and vegetables necessitated different ways of handling than different methods of handling the meat. Given that certain fruits and vegetables respirate uh, during transit, uh, fruit and vegetable shippers needed cars with the ability to allow air to flow through the car, which was uh, detrimental to meats. As produce was generally lighter, cars for fruits and vegetables grew in length, and they had slightly wider doors to accommodate packing crates, and they didn't have the hooks in the ceiling that uh, sides of uh, meat were hung on in the meat cars. Uh, fruit and vegetable cars had floor racks. Um, as you saw in that earlier uh, film clip, you can also see in this photograph here, the gentleman is standing on um, what look like pallets, but they're actually racks on which the air can circulate underneath the loads. Now, refrigerators had been about somewhere between 26, 29, or 36 feet long for most of the 19th century uh, in meat transport and also fruit and vegetable transport. But because produce was lighter, longer cars became possible and desired by shippers. The length for produce cars soon standardized at about 40 feet in length, and after 1931, some cars were built to a longer 50-foot length for very light or bulky produce. Some loads needed to move very fast, faster than freight trains traveled. Express refrigerator cars were developed to suit this need. They were designed to run in passenger trains. The speed was partially due to what they carried, which in some cases were more perishable items than ordinary produce or meats. Um, such as oysters, for example, um, but also uh, flowers, which uh, will go bad much more quickly, and um, items that uh, were the first ones to be harvested. And therefore, if they could get to market fast, it was worth the extra charge to send the shipment in a passenger train in order to be able to get ahead of the other um, retailers to have the first run of the season of a particular food. Now, these cars were generally based on freight cars, um, but uh, there were some designs that were a little bit longer and uh, fitted to the passenger car envelope, um, if you will, the design and shape of passenger cars. But the notable feature about them was that they were refrigerator cars that had passenger car trucks, trucks designed to run at passenger car speeds, uh, passenger brake systems, and steam and signal lines.
As readers of the timetable are certainly aware, rail car standardization was sort of the elephant in the room of American railroading at the late 19th century. While the refrigerator cars built in the 19th century may have conformed in many cases to the interoperability standards of the railroads on which they ran, when it came to the bits concerned with cooling a car and keeping it cold, things for which there were no standards or not even really recommended practice, the same wooden box cold with ice came in a dizzying variety of permutations. The most common area of diversity in the construction of the cars was probably the least obvious to the shipper, but the most crucial, the type and the application of the insulation. Now, a huge variety of things were used to insulate cars. I mentioned before that uh, they were using sawdust and charcoal in the earliest days of shipment, but also heavy paper, rubber, felt, cork, cellulose, or even just pockets of air in between the two walls of the car. Now, because insulation was hidden in the walls, the shippers wouldn't know what kind of insulation was in their car until the cargo got to the destination and they opened the door and found out whether or not the cargo had made it. And so many loads start were spoiling that the shippers complained, especially Georgia peach shippers, complained to the U.S. Department of Agriculture and asked them to do something about it. The passage of the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act put in place the Food Research Laboratory at the USDA and hired as the chief of the Food Research Laboratory was the lead chemist, Dr. Mary Pennington. Now, Pennington uh, first looked at the cold storage of chicken and after measuring the chemical changes in chicken as it spoiled, she came up with quantifiable chemical values to assess degradation over time, able to actually say chemically when things became so spoiled that they were past the point of being fit for human consumption. In short, Pennington was also able to demonstrate that cold could slow but not stop physical changes in food. And Pennington is one of a few people who you can look at in in history, it's often Uh, sort of considered uh, not really great form to point to one or two individuals and give them a lot of credit for a remarkable amount of change. But there are a couple of individuals in the history of refrigerator cars where it's worth saying this person, by their own work, made a substantial change in the technology of refrigerator cars and our experience of eating food today in the 21st century. Mary Pennington is one of them. In recognizing that each step in the chain between the farm and the table played a role in food quality, in 1910, Pennington started to look at the entire cold chain of perishable transport. And she found that many of the rail cars that were being placed in front of the docks for the perishable shippers were refrigerators in name only. They had very, very poor insulation, and some of them were actually even just regular box cars painted to look like refrigerator cars. Based on her previous chemical studies about the relationship between temperature and spoilage, Pennington went through a whole series of practical comparative tests on the road with refrigerator cars in very diverse conditions. She traveled all over the country testing refrigerator cars, working with railroads, And the result was a series of best practice recommendations for the minimum construction standards that would help refrigerator cars hold the temperatures at which spoilage would be curtailed. So not only did she know what spoilage was, quantified what spoilage was, she now knew what had to happen to refrigerator cars in order to make them hold that temperature ideally. Pennington standards were adopted during World War I by the USRA, the United States Railroad Administration. The USRA had taken over the railroads during World War I and determined that new freight cars were needed. And so they looked around for standards and looked to the USDA and the USDA handed them Pennington's best practice documentation. That was adopted in 1918. And three years later, a congressional committee, actually it was a a joint commission between the House of Representatives and Congress, uh, the Joint Commission for Agricultural Inquiry 
um, concluded that the standards developed by Pennington should be considered the minimum national requirement for refrigerator cars. These standards lean heavily on the best practices that were already known in the railroad industry. Um, and uh, so where they drew most heavily on Pennington's findings was in the amount of insulation used in the cars and the size and the types of the bunkers inside the cars that held the ice, both of which had varied considerably in the design. Furthermore, along with the changes to the interior design that helped distribute air more evenly around the car, Pennington recommended that uh, floor racks would be a standard feature um, so that the air could circulate under the load. At the time that uh, these laws were, or this law was put in place, this regulation was put in place, I think it was only about 10% of refrigerator cars on the rails met these standards. The standardization of refrigerator cars by the USRA re resulted in a car that was sufficient to meet the needs of the perishable products being shipped by rail in the late teens and into the middle of the 1920s. But by the end of the 20s, a new product would come into circulation that challenged the performance standards of even the very best contemporary refrigerator car, frozen food. Frozen food's need for cold would permanently alter refrigerator car technology. Whereas there had been a great deal of variety leading up to the USRA standards, the variety had been the result of a whole bunch of different uh, social groups who were trying to place their own interests into the technology with a whole bunch of different temperature requirements. Other than the occasional experiment, the refrigerator car in 1925 was still a wooden box cooled with ice. The advent of frozen food challenged what that wooden box cooled with ice could accomplish. It ushered in a transformation of the refrigerator car. And as we'll see, there were two questions. Can ice get cold enough? And how cold is cold enough? The frozen food industry had two challenges. One of them was the fact that no one actually asked for frozen food. Frozen foods were conceived and implemented by food manufacturers who, in order to sell frozen food, they needed to create a demand for it. But beyond convincing a skeptical public that the foods were actually safe to eat because many people thought that frozen food was just a way to disguise food that had gone bad, the cold chain needed to move frozen foods from where they were produced to the dinner table was not equipped for the lower temperatures that frozen foods required. Although about half of American homes in 1930 had a refrigerator, very few retail stores and even fewer homes had deep freezers. So until the 1940s, frozen foods were sort of a curiosity for many people or a luxury that only people who had access to deep freezers were able to enjoy. Now, the Second World War is a pivot point. It provided this pivot point that helped secure frozen foods a toehold in the American market. Wartime shortages of fresh foods combined with rationing changed Americans' attitudes towards food generally. Military contracts help the frozen food processors refine their freezing processes and their packaging processes. And the fact that frozen foods were removed from national rationing seven months before canned goods gave them a real shot in the arm for consumer acceptance. Frozen foods experienced a, a bit of a conflict at the end of World War II. They had become quite popular, um, but everybody jumped into the market and the quality of frozen foods diminished precipitously to the point that people started to get suspicious of them. And between 1946 and 1947, sales of frozen food dropped 87%. The industry was terrified, but what brought the industry out of, the industry being the frozen food industry, I should say, what brought the frozen food industry out of this was a wartime development, frozen concentrated orange juice. Frozen concentrated orange juice was developed by USDA scientists for the army. Uh, it was intended to get vitamin C to uh, troops in military theaters. And after the government released the patent for private production, business boomed, especially out of Florida. The growth rate in output of frozen concentrated orange juice from Florida was by almost any measure astronomical. 
You can see in the last line on this slide, between 1945 and 52, it grew 37,740%. And while somewhat more modest, the growth in concentrate from California also rose by orders of magnitude in the same period. The railroads and frozen food industry had two problems to solve. How low was the temperature that needed to be held at and how best to get there? The frozen food industry began shopping for transportation in the late 1920s. The refrigerator car lines generally thought that ice refrigeration with extra insulation would be sufficient. In the laboratory, you could get ice down to temperatures as low as minus six degrees by adding salt to the ice. While theoretically possible in a lab, in practice, most refrigerators, when you added a 30% uh, mixture of salt to the ice, you could get to about somewhere between four and 18 degrees. The situation was helped somewhat uh, in the 1940s when cars with fans inside were introduced where the fan could circulate the cold air around inside the car. This helped keep the temperatures more uniform, but the nature of ice refrigeration still meant that the temperatures inside the car were gonna vary depending on the amount of ice on board at any time. Insulation helped limit how much the temperature would vary over the course of the transit between one place to another, but it couldn't eliminate this variance entirely. And it wasn't really actually clear if, if temperatures as at 18 degrees were even a problem. The optimum temperature for frozen food took a long time to be determined. It wasn't for lack of recommendations. Everybody seemed to have an opinion about this at the time, but there was no real, uh, no real standard that anybody could look to. And so there was a quest to determine what frozen was and who determined what it was. Eventually, the industry settled on about zero degrees Fahrenheit, but that wasn't decided for decades. Now, mechanical refrigeration had been around for uh, since the 1870s in, in commercial use in, inside buildings and on steamships. And it had even been tested on rail cars, but it had been experimental, heavy, expensive, and didn't really work very well. So the application of mechanical refrigeration to trains and trucks had faltered. Uh, and it was competing with an established uh, infrastructure of ice. But the same problem had also bothered the trucking industry as well, how to get the temperatures cold enough. Enter into this Frederick McKinley Jones. Jones was an African-American inventor from Minnesota who developed a mechanical cooling apparatus for truck trailers. He's another one of these people who more or less single-handedly has changed the way that we eat. Jones's device was a small diesel-powered refrigeration unit that worked uh, on a truck trailer, and it had a special mechanism that sensed the temperature and regulated how much cooling based on the internal uh, temperature of the trailer. Jones and his business partner, Joseph Numero, founded a business to sell these uh, refrigeration units. Today, it's called Thermo King. It's still around. And in 1942, they contracted with the U.S. military to use refrigerated vehicles to deliver food and blood plasma into combat zones. This wasn't trial by fire. This was trial under fire. So it showed that mechanical refrigeration could hold up under the very worst and trying conditions. Mechanical refrigeration gave trucks a leg up in the frozen food industry. So refrigerator, rail car um, company, Food Growers Express, their interest was peaked not only in the encroachment of motor trucking on their business, but in the potential offered by the technologies they were using to compete. Fruit growers' dominance in the perishable loads of orange juice concentrate coming from the Southeast meant that they really had an interest in this because scientific studies had shown that when orange juice temperature is not held steady, it becomes very, very bitter. And people didn't want to drink orange juice unless it had been held at one constant temperature. In 1948, Fruit Growers Express orders 11 mechanical refrigerator cars. Um, by 1950, they ordered 165. And uh, from the 1950s onward, Fruit Growers starts making ice refrigerator cars, which was still their bread and butter, but they made them so that they could be converted into mechanical refrigerators later if mechanization catches on. It did. 
But railroads through the 1950s were still pretty skeptical. They were still ordering in dribs and drabs, but by 1955, the 2,100 new mechanicals were ordered. Interestingly, the railroad came to come around to this mechanical refrigerator idea, not just because of what they could do in terms of cooling, because of the idea that they might be suitable for all around temperature control, not just keeping things cold, but keeping things warm, and that they could be used as general purpose cars rather than specialty ones. So mechanical refrigerators made it easy to set a single temperature and hold that temperature regardless of whether or not it was cold or hot outside. And um, so by 1959, the Association of American Railroads starts to really kind of warm up to uh, mechanical refrigerators. Sorry, I guess that's a pun there. Um, Changes in the insulation technology, especially the use of polyurethane foam, allowed for better thermal control, which allowed cars to get bigger, allowed the doors to become larger. Also, uh, military technologies, a logistical legacy of World War II, such as shipping things on pallets and using forklifts to unload them, made uh, bigger doors more attractive. And so the cars, big sliding doors on refrigerator cars and larger refrigerator cars become more commonplace. Now, there's one more small thing to note why mechanical refrigerators really take off. In 1959, the, an association of food and drug officials at the state level called AFDUS decided that it would be good to have a law, uh, states for pa to pass a law that required refrigerated frozen food to be shipped at zero degrees throughout the entire cold chain. Now, this was protested, but when they finally did come up with their law, their, their draft legislation, uh, in 1962, some states start adopting it. And if a railroad is as a, a, a national network, as soon as one or two states start putting laws in place that say you have to do something, it becomes very logistically trying to uh, circumvent this or do things to get around that. So it's really forcing the railroads to uh, use mechanical cars. By 1962, the railroads can no longer depend on ice cars to ship uh, frozen food. And so in 1960, refrigerator cars, mechanicals made of just 3%. By 1969, it was 18%. So the popularity of frozen food plus regulation together drive the switch to mechanicals. The clear rise in mechanical refrigerator cars in the 1960s continued an upswing of frozen food deliveries into the 1970s. In 1945, the railroads had carried 80% of the frozen food traffic, but because they kind of were slow to get in on board with mechanicals, trucks, which did jump on with mechanical refrigeration, knocked a lot away from the railroads to the point where railroads only carried 13%. When they start getting involved in mechanicals, um, they start picking up traffic again. The frozen food shipper said, we really want to ship by rail, but you've got to give us mechanical refrigerator cars. So they did eventually um, in a rather trying way, but mechanicals came into their own during the 1960s. In the 1970s, you begin to see a resurgence. After losing out to the frozen food market for several years, the uh, railroads sort of reinvent how they use mechanical refrigerators. The Tropicana juice train was introduced um, to ship entire train loads of juice products from Florida to New Jersey. It symbolized a new sense of optimism about refrigerator car use. The juice train remains a fixture today in eastern seaboard railroading, and frozen food traffic has not gone away, and neither have railroads evolution, or if you want to call it evolution, railroads different technological attempts to transport it. Isothermal rail cars, whether they be mechanically cooled or heated, still ply the rails today. Some of them have mechanical uh, units on them. Some of them are merely insulated and have no cooling. The loads are cooled to a certain temperature, but the insulation is good enough that when the load is placed inside, the door shut, the car can keep that temperature for the duration of the trip. So insulated and mechanically refrigerated cars are still in service today. 
These are several photos I've taken in the area around uh, Maryland and Virginia. Here's a photograph of a perishable train in 2015 on the Union Pacific. So I just wanted to close with a reminder of the major themes. American refrigerator cars were driven by eating practices and eating practices shaped the refrigerator cars. They mutually shaped each other. Uh, the other thing is that the origin of refrigerator car transportation was in private companies, but railroads got on board. However, there's still a very tight linkage between private shippers of frozen foods and railroads. And as you've seen, the government at various different levels and in different ways, whether it be through testing, development of uh, best practices, passing laws, played a very significant role in the shaping of the refrigerator car and perishable transport. I'll put this up here. You can go to the YouTube. You don't have to memorize all this. Now you can go to the YouTube and screenshot this if you want. Here's a selection, a small selection of the vast literature about perishable shipping and railroad refrigerator cars that you may uh, consult on your own. And if you want to pick up two books, I think you would probably benefit from taking a look at these two, one being the Steam Era Freight Cars Reference Manual from Speedwitch Media. Um, Ted Collada has put this book together. It's a wonderful book with lots of information and lots of pictures about refrigerator cars and the various different refrigerator car lines that existed. And the American Railroad Freight Car by John White. John White was a Smithsonian curator and historian and this book will cover uh, the 19th century up until the turn of the century and, and the earliest days of refrigerator car shipment. So I'd like to say thank you uh, for your attention and I will take any questions if, if you have any. Great, that was wonderful, James. You didn't disappoint us. We have a lot more knowledge now of, of uh, the story of refrigerated rail cars. We have a couple of questions. And some of them, one of them is, what were the very early post-1860 cargo cars made of? And this is, I guess, in the context of their refrigerated car, because she goes on to ask, when the ice was hung from the ceiling, what was the roof of the car made of? And did it deflect the heat of the sun? Right. Um, there were a variety of different designs. I, I glossed over the absolutely stunning array of different refrigerator car designs in the late 19th century. Uh, most almost none of the cars in the 19th century refrigerator cars were made of anything other than wood with a few metal parts. So the refrigerator car body itself would have been made uh, with wood. The roof would have been made of wood. Um, and it was, uh, it was possible to make a, uh, an ice bunker, um, out of wood that was strong enough, but this was one of the challenges of uh, the cars that had ice bunkers in the roof over top of the load. Um, well, I don't believe that it deflected the roof, but I'm certain it is certainly possible that it did. I didn't come across in my research, I've not come across any um, mechanical reports where they're claiming that that's the big problem. The bigger problem with having the ice bunkers over top of the, the food um, was the fact that water would drain out onto the food and um, discolor it or um, uh, ruin the, the packaging that it was shipped in. You know, the crates would, would show up all, all waterlogged. Um, but it actually kept things colder than the end bunker designs. And in fact, the um, design of ice bunkers over top of the roof. Uh, American 
uh, refrigerator car companies came back to it several times over the course of the 20th century. And Canadian refrigerator cars um, used it very, very prevalently. Uh, they That was a very typical Canadian design to have the ice bunker over top of the load and not at the ends of the car. Now, you mentioned that the pond ice was the preferential ice used in the early stage of a refrigeration. So did the meat packers own the ponds from which the ice was taken? Or was that a contract with municipalities or other places? I mean, in other words, do you have any idea where they got the pond ice? Most of it came from New England okay. or um, the upper Midwest. Um, the ownership of the water or the ponds uh, would probably depend on the meat packer. Certain meat packers were very interested in vertical integration. They wanted to own every step of the process. Others were a little bit less concerned about it and so probably would have just simply bought ice from um, suppliers. But it was a big industry, um, not just for refrigerator cars, but for home use and industrial use. Um, so the, the refrigerator car companies were uh, certainly not the only ones looking for ice because it was the, the way to cool things. It was really the only way to cool things um, before the advent of mechanical refrigeration. So back in the early days, we're talking now meat, the meat packer days, when they butchered the meat, and put it into the refrigerator cars. Did they freeze the car, freeze the meat, or chill the meat before it was put into the car, uh, and then load it? And then that's for the early days. And then a similar question: when we think of of after all the progression from uh, the the early days of ice then into the reefer cars, did meat packers butcher the meat or did they hang it as they had in the early days? So that's two questions, but related. Um, yes, the two related questions. Um, the meat would have uh, been uh, slaughtered and dressed and packed and cooled on site uh, and then loaded into cars, which often would have been pre-cooled. Um, in the video that I showed, you could see where they were icing the car before it was loaded. But in some cases, they would actually have um, fans that would blow cold air into the car in order to cool down the inside of the car before they loaded it. Because if you load frozen stuff into a warm car, it's going to get all soft right away anyhow. So they would have to um, cool the car down before they loaded it. Uh, in the earliest days, they weren't freezing the meat solid. They were getting it down close to the frozen temperature, but not, I, I think it was, they referred to it as chilled meat. And so I think that their, their ideal, if I recall correctly, was just slightly above the freezing point. So like 34 degrees, 36 degrees. Um, so that, uh, because apparently one of the things that, in freezing food is that if you don't freeze food very quickly, ice crystals uh, form inside the tissues or, or inside the cells of the, um, the produce, right? Or tissues of meat. Yeah. And the slower the freezing process, the larger the ice crystals are. So um, they were trying to avoid uh, situations where, uh, and, and what happens is like when those larger ice crystals melt, then the structure of the meat and the structure of the vegetables is broken up. Um, and so you get mush. That's why when you freeze uh, like raspberries, they don't come back in like quite the proper way. Yeah. So and, and so what they would do is they would uh, pre-cool the cars and they would ship meat um, hanging from hooks, uh, Sides of beef, that, that was how meat got shipped it, well into the 20th century, into the 50s or 60s. Um, the meat car still had hooks on the roof um, to transport sides of beef that way. So do they still transport sides of beef in that same way? 
not as Today? much. A lot more packaging happens um, at the uh, plants because okay. uh, now instead of a side of beef, you, uh, most of us here on the call can probably remember when you would go into the grocery store and the butcher was there working behind the counter and cutting meat to be put out into the styrofoam containers in the freezers, right? Or the refrigerators out there. But now an awful lot of that meat arrives at the grocery store pre-cut, right? It's already been processed at the factory. So it's it, it, it gets loaded into the truck or the train. Um, and most of the meat doesn't move by rail these days. It's, it's mostly fruit and vegetables that moves by rail. Most of the meat will get loaded into a truck already packaged in that styrofoam tray. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we have uh, on the line, uh, there's one more question here and then a comment. Okay. Uh, we have on the line a, a mechanic who worked with CP rail in the 70s. And so he was very interested in what you have to say because reefer maintenance was his thing back oh, in the great. 70s. <laughs> and he, he loved working on them, but they're all gone now. But he comments that when a car of beef fails on the line, you never saw such a mess or smelled dot, dot, dot. <laughs> so, oh, so yes, just... I am absolutely sure that is true. Uh, and I can only imagine what, <laughs> you know, what it must have been like for some of those early shippers when they open up the door and everything's gone bad um it, it and then having to clean that out <laughs> well thank, no, thank you, you. So, thank you so much uh we've had a, a great uh inspiring talk tonight from you james and we've all learned a lot and we and thank you for andy uh for your comments firsthand <laughs> about what it was like being a mechanical reefer maintenance person um, and <laughs> Andy, I would love to talk to you at some point about your experiences with this. Uh, and you can point out all the mistakes I made. <laughs> and uh, to one and all, uh, thank you so much for participating. If you like this, it'll be loaded up on our DC NRHS YouTube channel in a week or so. And so we invite you to go and see this again and send it to your friends and neighbors. Uh, as well as enjoy the other YouTubes that we have out there. And if you love the, the DC NRHS as, many, as much as most of us on the call do, consider becoming a volunteer. We really need your help. And we have positions on the Dover Harbor for stewards, porters, chefs, and mechanical officers. We'd love to have your experience, and, and we will train. In addition, we have opportunities to work as a librarian or work with me on the timetable. Even if you just have, you don't have time for an article, just how about working on the monthly trivia column or even just send me uh, story ideas. I would love to have them. And if you love these programs as much as most of us on the call do, consider volunteering to be part of the program committee. We can really use your help. And so thank you all for attending today. Enjoy your St. Patrick's Day. I have just green on for my Irish heritage, but we all wish you a very happy St. Patrick's Day and have a wonderful evening. Good night, one and all. <laughs>